Okay, uh, so welcome everyone to the to this panel that's titled the Digital Agenda. Um, as you probably have uh, read, uh, what this uh, agenda is about. Actually, at its heart, it has this question, uh, uh, which is, uh, what are the premises and promises of integrating computational approaches at the crux of the design process, linking architecture uh, to urbanism? Um, so in a way, uh, this uh, panel will try to show basically uh, the use of design tools that are open to diverse social negotiations, fluid market forces, and fast-paced technological changes uh, as potentially uh, informing decision-making, but also potentially managing uh, unpredictabilities of cities. Um, it will try to reveal through emerging uh, computer technologies uh, what would be the potential to generate innovative but also flexible approaches to urban form. Um, our three speakers, uh, we will be starting with Amy Tobery uh, from Space Syntax Limited and the University College of uh, London. Uh, Amy's presentation uh, uh, will tackle uh, uh, actually the work that they do at Space Syntax uh, entitled Introduction to Space Syntax, a data-driven approach to urban planning and design. Uh, I, I won't be going into details in all the speakers' bio. Uh, again, these are uh, available for you to read on any of our uh, posters. Our second presentation is uh, by Eduardo Rico Caranza from the Bart Bartlett School of Architecture uh, at the University College of London also. Uh, uh, Eduardo will be talking about uh, relational urbanism, uh, bringing design agendas into participation processes. And we'll end with Manal Sayed and Hanadi Samhan from uh, Khatib An Alami, who will be talking about integrating uh, GIS and geo design as new trends and rapid simulation and uh, for the purpose of evaluation. Uh, so without for much further ado, we will start with Amy and uh, each speaker will have uh, 20 minutes and then we'll end with discussion. 20, right? Right, Robert? 30 minutes? 20 minutes? 30? 30 minutes. <laughs> um, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, sorry. So, so yes. Um, well, um, I'm actually um, representing Space Syntax Limited, which is a consultancy firm. Uh, spun out of UCL, so mainly uh, focusing on the practitioner's point of view. Um, I'll, I'll just carry on. Yeah. Um, yes, pr practitioner's point of view, um, how we use data and modeling techniques in actual um, planning and design projects across the world. <laughs> no, it's all right. Um, so, I'd like to start a question uh, with a question. I'm sure that um, you, um, you'd also kind of sometimes think about this. The, what is the city for? Um, the cities should be, as opposed to rural areas or the nature, should be for efficiency, convenience and um, social life. There are so many things that attract um, people to cities and why we build cities. And it shouldn't really be about um, discomfort or isolation. But over the time that we have kind of established in the built environment professional um, professions, established all these different um, expertise. Um, there are people who are thinking about environment and, um, and the building design, property, the economy, health, and the transport and so on. So we developed all these silos and they themselves became so big that Often we find in real projects that we've, we we lost the sight of people, which is really should be the centre in this whole um, activities to create built environment. So at space syntax, um, 
uh, we'll go through a bit more about what the space syntax is. But essentially, it is a theory and um, methodology and tool to analyze the spatial network. And we, so we pioneered the spatial network analysis. And the reason why we do it, the reason why it's useful is that because we understand that the spatial structure affects movement, social, economic, cultural, and the environmental performance of places. We don't do it just because it, we can do it, or it, it's cool to do it. It's because we know that the, this understanding the spatial structure would lead us to understand the relationship between the design of space and the, what is important, what matters to us. And so, interesting thing about, well, useful things about this methodology is that it works at different scales. So it also works at the, the building scale. And this is an example of a museum in London. And um, we'll elaborate more later on, but um, so the left-hand side is the spatial analysis. The analyzing the network of spaces and um, identifying the kind of accessibility patterns within the building. And on the, on the right hand side is observed movement. And then you can see that the, the red, the more accessible area, is actually attracting more movement. So it works in, in a similar way. It's the, the spatial structure is not the only driver, but it, it has a very crucial role in um, shaping the movement patterns. And also the spatial structure relates to land use patterns. And so this is the, the top one is the spatial network analysis. The red, the warmer the color is, it's more accessible, it's more integrated, um, and it's easy to, to access to. And the, the bottom one is the land use distribution, and the red ones are retail, so the active uses. And we, we, high, we tend to find a really good correlation between the active uses and the spatial structure, the root hierarchy, because that the, the way the, the movements are naturally attracted because of the way that the streets are connected. If you put shops in those places, it tends to survive. Whereas if you put the shops in a segregated location, you need to put more and more attractions to bring people in. So it's not impossible, but the natural alignment is very important for the retail activities, for example. And it also affects economy. Um, this is um, uh, the street density. We found the very strongest um, street density, uh, strongest correlation between street density and um, employment patterns, for example. And also relates to land value. This is a, this was a project in Darwin, North, uh, Northern Territory in Australia, and we managed to develop a kind of predictive land value model to include in the argument and convincing the investors, landowners, to, um, about, about this new proposal, what kind of value that they could bring in. And it also relates to safety. So there's a study about the crime patterns, it's a burglary as well as um, robbery. So there are different spatial conditions that would not necessarily encourage, but that we, find, we found associations between the certain crime patterns and the spatial conditions. And also health. And um, I will show you more on this later. But um, so there is, a, in, at least in the West, it's a very big thing now about obesity, for example, the level of physical activities. And these things are some, somehow influenced by the, the way that the spaces are connected with, e with each other, as well as where things are, where your house is, um, where your home is, um, in relation to where your um, work or school is. 
and in relation to that, that there is um, also an like, equality issue. The special condition might um, aggravate the, the social inequality, for example. And um, these things are very big issue. And um, without actually understanding what this, um, the, the spatial structure is doing to the people's lives, it is very difficult to address this inequality issue only by looking at, um, um, say, the demographic data. So what are GPs? Oh, sorry, that's a general practice at um, clinics. And, um, and also environment, so the, the spatial structure affects the, the movement patterns quite strongly. And the movement patterns um, basically relates to the transport modes that the people are more likely to take. So a certain geometry would um, create more car dependence and higher car dependency, and therefore the higher um, CO2 emissions for example. So it's very important to understand um, the spatial structure when you're thinking about the kind of economic and social outcomes. And so we are, yes, data-driven, uh, we use data-driven driven approach, but um, we do it because we want to put people at the heart of the process of planning and design. Um, data analytics and things like that tends to be seen as a more kind of dry number game and all this mathematics and things like that. But the purpose of doing that is to put people at the heart. So we, we have very human focused approach. So a little bit about the space syntax theory without going into details how it works in a very, very simple way. So space syntax analysis, the spatial um, is that the spatial network analysis is based on graph theory. And it's not as difficult as you might think. And that if you remember this, you'd understand the principle of it. And then that tends to be sufficient um, in most of the cases. So, so there are two um, rooms. And it's very, very similar. This are these left one and then the right one. It's very similar. Just different openings. But the space syntax is interested in the relationship between spaces. So the spaces A, B, C can be represented on the left-hand side. A is connected to B. B is connected to C. C is also connected to A. So when we represent as a graph, it becomes like the one at the bottom. And on the other hand, on the right hand side, although in terms of layout it might look very, very similar, it's the relationship between spaces are very, very different. So A is connected to C and B, but B and C are not connected. So the graph becomes like that. So once you start to make a graph, then you you can um, start calculating the relation, quantifying the relationship between spaces. So what these numbers represent is the, the depth of the space. So from C on the, on the left hand side, from C in order to go to A it takes one step and in order to go to B it takes one step. So to cover all the spaces within the system it takes two steps. So that's why next to C, you have got the number 2. And so the relationships are very equal. So for, for A, that's also 2. C, um, B, also 2. Whereas if you um, see the, the layout on the right-hand side, from C, to go to A, it takes one step. But to go to B, it takes two steps. So altogether, you need three steps to cover everywhere within the system. But if you start from A, you only have two steps to go to everywhere within the system. So this is how we start to quantify the relationship, the depth of the spaces. And in reverse, it becomes um, the means of identifying how integrated some spaces are. 
and then so you do the same thing it's a little bit bigger but that was the very very principle you do it for bigger and then this imagine this is like a house or something like that the small building and then so the on the left hand side it's you start from zero the space zero highlighted space and then the whole structure will be like this the total depth of the whole structure is 16 you're adding all these numbers and on the on the right hand side if you start from a different room all of a sudden that the same layout can be seen as a very different structure so this could be relating to the functions but if you misplace the function in uh, with the uh, network property it might not work in the way that you might want to to put for example if you don't want to have your bedroom as the the one in the middle <laughs> otherwise if you did that everyone is coming through all the time and um, but at the same time if you put them an entrance in the highlighted space on, on the right it means that you're creating a very deep space that might be your intention or might not be in your intention so it depends on how you want to design but it becomes a tool to understand the relationship between spaces which naturally relates to the characters so so you do that for every room every space and then you get this picture and we tend to reverse the, the figures so that we highlight integration rather than segregation so the red means more integrated meaning that it's shallower it's less depth and the, the deeper one, uh, ones are highlighted with the blue and colder colors so this is a very s simplified principle but this is enough for you to understand that what how it works so this is so this is what we apply to a much larger scale and um, so what we are interested in is not buildings but the spaces between buildings and so um, in the spatial network model uh, we tend to um, represent a space with lines we calculate the network properties but behind this it's exactly the same thing happening so space syntax is a language language of, sp of space like mathematicians use the mathematic formula musicians you use notes and us use the, the language it is to describe the, the nature of the space and so we use uh, modeling to predict certain behaviors linking design parameters and behavioral social economic cultural environmental outcomes and um, we also use modeling as a design tool to test different options but not only just comparing numbers but the numbers that relate to outcomes that social and economic outcomes that really mean to people and also data and the modeling becomes um, a communication tool so it creates a shared understanding in common language of human activity so the design might be not be might not be accessible to everyone not everyone understands the drawings but if you say that this means that this is going to be more active there are going to be more people 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 begin to understand what it means and people begin to understand different design options and then start to be able to evaluate them so um, a bit of an example of how we apply and then this is a very old project but um, it's very um, representative so I would like to, to use this project and uh, Trafalgar Square is one of the prominent most prominent um, public space in London and back in 2000 uh, or pre 2002 I believe um, it was it was a very underused and uh, they were full of pigeons and only tourists who were just following the guidebooks that they had to go to tick the box um, but there were not many um, local people so there was a competition about redesigning of Trafalgar Square and so we did we teamed up with the Norman Foster's office and we um, started with observation 
we looked at how people move around. I'm sorry for the resolution, it's very, it looks very bad. But um, the blue lines are the movement and the red dots are the stationary activities. And then we found that there are not many people actually going through. So we had a proof of not people, not many people going through. And um, actually the, a lot of the volume of the movement was the, the periphery, not even periphery of this, the space, but at the other side of the street. So we did the spatial network modeling and then we kind of confirmed that yes, that's partly because that the space is actually segregated in relation to the wider network. So there's no wonder that, that it's, you don't find people because it's really difficult to get to. So then we use this modeling as a kind of predictive tool um, for the redesign. So what we um, proposed was the central staircase. And so if you allow people to go through the space and the increase the connectivity, then we might be able to make the space more popular. And so this was a really good um, kind of anatypical process of starting with observation, explaining why that is the case, and then predicting what you want to achieve and um, delivering it. And it was particularly important in this project because the wall that we were um, proposing to knock down was listed. So English heritage was um, strongly opposing to this idea. So we, had the, we needed to have a very strong evidence. So it really helped the stakeholder engagement. And so this is what we envisaged at that time. And this is how it's now. So it was more than um, the, the better, much better results than we expected. And now there's so many events happening, especially in the summer, and it's a place that people want to be rather than just um, occupied by pigeons. Um, and so the same, as I mentioned earlier, that the same methodology can be applied to um, building scale and then I'll go through very quickly but um, so this is the, the spatial network model and on the top um, sorry top right corner there's a blue part and the, the museum was very concerned about people not being in that corner and um, despite the fact that they had the most um, important artifact displayed in that room. So that should have been the highlight of the museum, but they didn't, they didn't see many people. So they're wondering why. So we provided this analysis and then said, well, there is no, it, it's not a surprise that it's very segregated. And then we used the techniques, um, modeling techniques, to come up with um, potential solutions. So um, and they were thinking about um, extension. They didn't want to aggravate the, the current situation. And so we did the multiple option testing to, um, to see how we can achieve the kind of desirable outcomes. And this is not to give any answers. It, it doesn't immediately say like this is good or the other one is, is worse. It's about the kind of helping the thinking or, and creating the vision for the likely outcomes so that the designers can try to achieve what um, they want to achieve. So uh, each place has a unique spatial signature. Although the, this um, the relationship between the space and the economic and social outcomes um, itself is, is universal, but the actual spatial structure is very unique everywhere. Um, this is an example of London, this is Beijing, Tokyo, Washington DC, I don't know if anyone can spot this. Um, so we've been using this um, tool to, to help planning and design projects across the world. And I will try to um, introduce the, the recent development in the next five minutes, if I can. Um, so, so this has been a kind of a traditional space syntax approach. 
um, using the spatial network analysis. But um, the recently, with the um, data, like more um, big data and um, recent technological uh, developments, we've been trying to apply the spatial network in, in wider, uh, wider um, applications. And so we use spatial network as um, description of spatial structure as well as device to connect spatial data and also going into like a fine scale of spatial analysis and I'll show you some examples. So the opportunities that sort of this emerging and kind of big data and technologies and, the, and also this um, issues, complex issues. So in order to address these complex issues that we have developed this technique called integrated urban modeling um, where we would um, link the spatial network modeling with the transport network, um, population data, land use data and so on to, um, to develop more comprehensive outputs. And, and this is also important in um, communicating to, for example, in planners or in practice, it is important that we, we use the language that people understand so that they can be implemented. So especially for planners, we wanted to um, produce something that's really easy to understand. You don't have to understand the space syntax theory. So this, for the, all the academic people, that it might be very, very awfully simple. But this is, um, um, for example, access to job opportunities. Um, it's an area called Milton Keynes in England. They have a very high obesity rate and um, it's very car dominant place. So um, one of the things that we wanted to address was, well, actually this was done for the um, transport um, planning team at the council to, um, to help them develop the local transport strategy through addressing their health issues and equality issues and so on. So this is by walking within 15 minutes how many job opportunities you'd have. It's the count of commercial uses. It's a very simple calculation. But you'd, uh, we can also see the kind of population distribution within each kind of increment catchment. And you can see that um, it's only in this kind of central area, certain areas that you have high accessibility, but um, there are lots of areas that's almost empty. And then if you allow to use um, public transport, what it happens, and then the area of high number of uh, job opportunities would increase. But if you compare that with the private vehicle, it's a completely different picture. So by calibrating these two, it's a ratio between the, of the number of job opportunities between the private vehicle and public transport. If you compare them, you, it becomes kind of the in index for the car dependency. So we're comparing, so the darker blue means that you have, in this case, like 50 times more job opportunities if you use the car compared to public transport. So in these areas, it's not a surprise that people choose car. And why, why would you use um, public transport? And the, the closer to grey, it means that the, the numbers are quite similar. But unfortunately, in, in Milton Keynes, there was nowhere that public transport would give you more advantage than the, the private vehicle. So this was to highlight that how spatial structure, as well as the land use distributions, would affect the people's choice of um, transport. And you, with this analysis, you can begin to understand, so okay, so who live in these areas, what kind of intervention would be effective, and so on, by overlaying with different data sets. And I will skip that. No, I won't skip that. Um, so this is um, it's a similar approach, but a different analysis of, um, again, kind of, thinking about the walkability. So again, this is very simple, but calculating a number of different land use types within the five minutes walk. So the, the warmer the color is, the more variation that you have within five minutes. 
so what we the lounges um, lounges that we picked were like retail food shops and services and things that you'd probably want to go quite often regularly so if you live in one of those red areas or like warmer color areas you can get things done in five minutes walk quite easily but if you live in blue areas then it's beyond five minutes so you might begin to think about using different transport modes so it's kind of very quick way of looking at the potential kind of walkability um, using data and this is quite similar to what we had earlier about the um, so the general practice and so we, we can calculate the catchment, so it's a typical catchment analysis, but also reverse the analysis to say that how many GPs, how many pra practice, practices that you can get in 15 minutes walk. And, the, and also thinking about people, that having access, physical access is one thing, but in reality, do they actually have vacancy? Are they full? And so the capacity is another issue. So you can begin to filter this analysis depend, um, based on the capacity of each practice, for example. And also, are they actually good? When you move to a new place, you probably what you do is to check the, the review of each practice. You don't want to register to the most rubbish one in the area. So the, there is a quality information out there. So by combining these things, you can start to filter. And so this is, for example, a very different picture to what we've seen earlier, just based on the physical accessibility. So these things become very important and data are very useful in understanding the actual implication to people's lives. The last one is then um, it's also kind of mental health side. This is social isolation. We used, um, um, there is an organization, charity organization um, can, came up with this um, social isolation score based on demographics and tenure type and marital status and so on. And so we overlay that with the kind of spatial conditions. So what you see on the, on the blue lines is effectively the size of a neighborhood. How many neighbors that you have within a 15 minutes walk, for example. So you can begin to highlight that um, the high risk areas where the demographics, in terms of demographics, there's a high risk of social isolation and especially also segregated, that becomes the kind of aggravated risk. So, for example, for the council to be able to focus on the, focus their services on certain areas. Yeah, so that's the all <laughs> examples of um, us using data and modeling in planning and design. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, uh, good morning. Thanks all for coming and uh, thanks Robert for inviting me and uh, uh, American University of Beirut for organizing this, this event. I am Eduardo Rico, PhD candidate in UCL and I co-direct MA Landscape Urbanism in the DAA. Uh, I'm going to be showing today the work that we've carried out in relational urbanism. This is a small practice that I have with my partner Enriqueta Llabres, who also teaches in UCL, uh, that in a way deals with digital tools for what we would call design based uh, participation. Uh, it kind of like comes from the, this intersection of uh, the new abundance of data in cities, the, 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 the capacity for people to fabricate and promote data in cities. But at the same time, the emergence of systems that allow quite sort of like detailed design interaction and evaluation almost in real time. That is changing the way in which designers relate to stakeholders and other members of the public. One of the first cases that I wanted to show is this case of uh, Abu Dhabi, a blue carbon project. This is a 
basic websites promoted by Abu Dhabi government. What it does is it allows people to understand the ecological value and performance of different areas of the territory just by clicking around in an interactive website. It allows to understand the CO2 capture, I think, is qualities of their landscape in a, in a very intuitive and fast way. Um, other examples, such as the Smart Citizen Initiative in Barcelona, allow people to upload data, evidence, gathered from different sensors, which in a way are collated in what is called typically public participatory GIS systems, uh, which in a way puts data open to the public and up to a certain extent, one could argue, help held governments accountable for their actions and whether their actions actually stick to the parameters that they initially set. What these type of practices are doing is they are sort of like opening up a question or a debate about how data, parameters, evidence relates to the creation of shared values. So is this relationship between parameters and values, uh, which we are quite interested in the office, uh, and how design and participation actually fits in that sort of like duality. Uh, I'll start discussing the question of parameters and values. Parameters are bounded to define a particular system from which a quantity is selected according to specific circumstances and in relation to which other variables may be expressed. Values, on the other hand, point out to the fact that something is held to deserve its importance or worth something from someone. So while both parameters and values they are related r relative to other things, parameters are more linked to systems while values are more linked to individuals, to groups, to a different form of fabricating space, time, and value. And when we think about how we create space, time, and value, I think it's quite useful the thinking from Harvey that defines two ways of defining space, time, and value. One is the social construction in a way that comes imposed by established mechanisms, social reproduction systems, implemented uh, and directed uh, through means of social control. And we have other, what we call a relational construction of a space, time and value, which in a way is this intersection between different groups which have similar views and values uh, that form domains which intersect in this sort of a way of fabricating uh, space. Uh, in a way, we have to think about how this duality between parameters and values has fabricated cities, and it has had an impact on cities ever since, ever, I mean, uh, through history. And I'll, I'll show some examples of, 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 of London, of how these two worlds, in a way, fabricate and shape our cities. Uh, this is an old map of London, I think it's a 17th century, no sorry, 18th century, uh, and I show two examples of how London has been shaped by the answer of people to the formation of, of knowledge. One was the case of cholera, 1854 I think it was, that in some areas managed to wipe out 10% uh, of the population, or 10, between 10 and 15% of the population. Uh, and it was so severe that in a way it triggered action by, in this case, John Snow that managed to realize that quite a lot of the incidents of cholera happened to take place in one place, in one area, which is Soho. So what he did is actually he took the effort of mapping out every single incident of cholera in the map of London and realized that they would cluster around a well to a point of extraction of water. And what happens is that in a horizontal terrain, uh, the area of influence of the wells, in a way, would relate to what would we call a Voronoi diagram, and it was sort of like used to conceptualize this idea of catchments of different wells. That led to the closure of the, the um, Soho well at the time, the realization that actually cholera was being transmitted through water and contaminated water. It changed the entire protocol of dealing with the disease, helped save lives, and opened up a new area in modern epidemiology. So in that sense, this making explicit of information helped shape policy. The same city, some years earlier, almost the opposite happened. Uh, in this case, it was after the fire of London, and I, th I think it was three days, uh, most of central London was burned down to ashes. And within one year or so, there was a competition for proposals to change the center of London. And you just got everything, right? You got the Baroque plan, sort of with the, stoile, the, the little etoile, kind of like, sort of like axis. All the plans were meant to be more hygienic, 
more efficient from the perspective of movement uh, obviously top down led uh, we had so much more rectangular based more sort of a lofty parametric <laughs> kind of proposals at the time but all of them had a, an idea of making the city more hygienic more efficient but they all went to hell it didn't really work because simply at the time owners didn't agree it was just impossible to agree partially one could argue because of the values of sort of like English mentality my house is my castle partially because the sheer problematics of the owners of the land were not in London they were living somewhere else because they didn't have a house so both those two things in a way help to shape the city nowadays but in a way has exactly the same spatial pattern it had from the Romans because in a way people had that sort of set of values they didn't want to lose and didn't want to sort of like when I mean to sort of give up for a different type of social description of the city uh, so in a way in a way we have to think how designers fit in this world where parameters and values both shape our cities so one can ask us I mean, we should ask ourselves what are designers good for what, what why should designers be doing this and why don't we just leave it up to whatever somebody who is smarter and sort of like more organized than us and one of the reasons being is that somehow while parameters are linked to explicit knowledge values have a tacit dimension tacit the way uh, Polanyi said it is we know more than we can tell relates to a knowledge that can be transmitted you can work with it you can distribute it you, it really flows around everywhere before you can actually make it explicit so there are things you can do but you cannot really tell how you do them so you know how to ride a bicycle but you cannot really code it like you have to bloody write it so the same I mean in a way designers are pretty much used to deal with this tacit dimension of this I mean, I would argue design and somehow be able to navigate these worlds and potentially be able to tap into forms of knowledge that were closed before and that's what we do in what we call relational urban models uh, these are interactive devices that show or include data analytics but allow people to engage in design somehow with the idea of being able to extract to learn to play with but learn at the same time from what all these people think so I'll show some examples that in a way start from the data-driven side of things and they move towards more the tacit expression and playfulness of uh, in a way trying to design and interact with different forms of installations. So the first two projects, particularly this one, uh, were done in a joint venture with uh, Relational Urbanism and Arup. I was working at Arup at the time. Uh, with the purpose of creating tools to engage with fast growing metropolises uh, such as China or Brazil uh, Brazil at the time uh, not anymore. Uh, so we, we took two case studies one of them was this and I'll show you how in way the case study shaped the tool and show you how the tool works of redeveloping an urban village in the center of Shenzhen uh, that's near Hong Kong urban villages are sort of like old fabric that has been sort of like extruded up with the growth of the city and nowadays are typically surrounded by new city new I mean it's all new but this is newer city so perhaps this is from the 80s this is from the 90s that's <laughs> already then from the 10 years it was old at the time uh, they are in some cases suffocatingly dense so they have these so-called kissing windows uh, houses that actually they meet onto the top uh, so there's no light coming through not everywhere there are other areas which are so much more decent they host bustling life and activities and they host key workers so that's one of the reasons why there was a polemic or at least a debate at the time but part of these urban villages had to remain in the city to maintain a certain sense of social diversity and sort of like being able to create a bit more of coherence so part of the design sort of a like brief for the tool was how can we create a tool that allows us to create quickly scenarios of different forms of demolishing and intervening in the fabric uh, that in a way comply with certain environmental and traffic regulations give money to the developers so that they can actually get the money back uh, but they still maintain part of the sort of like social infrastructure that has been living there 
Uh, so this is the way, uh, sort of like three option assessment with graphical representation of diversity going from total demolition to partial demolition going along all the site, north and south. But I'll go through how the tool works and what are the layers of information that it deals with. We started with environmental analysis. Uh, shadow in that part of the world is an issue in the winter. So there is a regulation by which certain, I mean, the lower part of the residential area has to have sunlight at whatever number of hours, and I think it's on whatever day in January, for already. <laughs> Uh, but we did some analysis and tests and realized that actually if we were to have some sort of like slab oriented buildings there was an orientation that worked better because the amount of shadow on the ground was less so in a way we thought that this direction was something we wanted to keep and somehow we wanted to integrate we had a generative network model in which what we could do is make a drawing of the area that we wanted to keep the model would create a first crust or a first layer of a small scale blocks uh, with a smaller sort of like size of buildings and then this sort of like oriented 24 degree layer plus uh, two networks that were in a way connecting uh, main streets outside of the site we thought about this idea of creating a sense of coherence in terms of height so the existing buildings, the bits remaining in a way would continue uh, with the podiums and, some, and we will have sort of like growth density a bit in the podiums and then the towers on the top so there was a podium typology proposal uh, having podiums that were more like 130 closed blocks uh, like other ones that were more larger scale types more almost like a campus type of scale or I would say like a UV scale then scattered open plots and more densified ones so in a way we could pick and choose from them and then grow density with towers on the top on top of the typical solution that in a way we could actually uh, cut uh, if we wanted with uh, to provide even more uh, sun at the bottom sort of like with the solar fans that you have there this was sitting on top of what we call an optimization model uh, I'll show you later how it works it tries to maximize the benefit for the developer uh, within certain in this case infrastructural constraints so it always tries to float the development until limits have been reached so all in all we would get this type of solutions 3d uh, fabrics out of the out of the project uh, and this was kind of like the overall workflow that we've discussed the sort of like flow chart of uh, the relational model I'll go through how the tool uh, was looking like at the time so you could actually bring the site in this case you could bring the bits that you wanted to demolish or maintain in this case you click white means that that site is being maintained so the rest the sort of like blue bits are going to be uh, demolished uh, so you could click generate it will bring a sort of like generative in this case this cell type Voronoi-esque uh, type of, of blocks into it um, so once you bring the blocks when you create the blocks you pass on to actually draw that escape on top of them so in a way you could uh, uh, set up the, the model running and go into you could select groups you could paint with a paintbrush the areas that you wanted more or less height in this case it was residential density office density in a way you were allowed to paint up and down these quantums of uh, land use or proportions of land use that you wanted uh, equally you could pick and choose uh, types uh, oh, sorry yeah here we go I'll go a bit fast here uh, but you could just say certain types wanted in one area or the other area then you would go into a land use introduction so in this case we started by introducing I think it was one and a half million square meters of development uh, one and a half sorry uh, one and a half of resi 100,000 of office and 50,000 of retail so you could in a way type it and say I want this much development and then to have a pre-visualization of how it was looking like and what it was sort of like interesting in a way from the perspective of the land use is that you could then have a look at the impacts on money or traffic and limit the development based on say traffic so in this case we are seeing that we have to we are limiting the amount of traffic in the morning and in the evening 
So what's going to happen is that the amount of land use is going to self sort of like regulate down to sort of like try to meet those targets. So we had, I think it was like 48 targets. We could pick seven of them to use as ceilings. And, try, and, the, and the model was trying always to fill in as much as possible uh, of use to comply with those ceilings. That they, could, they were not only traffic, they would be also other types of uses. At the end of the model, what we could do, here we go, let's see, probably faster. We could then turn on a more detailed 3D preview of the building. So instead of these massing envelope thingies, we actually could see how the, the 3D was going to look, all together with the revenue and land use distribution. So let's see if I, hang on. Yeah, so you can have a preview of the 3D, of how the planes were looking like and how the towers that, in a way, would fit the build would look like. Uh, this allowed us to make a number of options and demonstrate which ones, in a way, could maintain proportions of the urban fabric while building and giving away what the developer wanted in terms of money. Similar case, but with a bit of a different approach, but we use the same tool. I'll go quickly through this one. It's in Santos, in Brazil, where uh, it was low density industrial area that required, instead of one single landowner that wanted to build more, uh, it was many different landowners, each of them with a different agenda. So the point is, how can we make, how can we test incentive schemes to get them grouped together and create a network of public spaces? So it was not necessarily about one single unit, it was about how do we make sure people get together. And the idea was, we can actually use the typical policy of giving away incentives such that the more public space you give up and the more you network with your neighbors, the more we give you to build. So it's a way of encouraging people to actually do what you want to do anyway, which is to create this connection between plots in a very, I mean, a bit difficult to walk around the space, quite post-industrial, low density. So we use the tool in similar ways. You could actually trade land density from one place into the other to test how these incentives would look like. Because there's obviously a point where if you give too much density for people that give too much area, you end up with super tall needles and don't make any, any sense, actually. So we wanted to test these, in a way, tools. And in this case, it was about using these tools for letting others negotiate. In the sense, there is not so much the issue of the expert traffic engineer discussing with economics. But it's more about two different landowners seeing if they meet together to agree on something. This is a small workshop we did in Wuhan. Uh, it's more of an art installation than anything else, uh, where we were actually trying to get people to understand what's the relationship between their actions and the environment. Wuhan is the capital of the Yangtze River. So we wanted to create an installation that an, uh, allowed people to see the impact of their actions on the river systems. So the installation was, in a way, quite simple. It was a, a river model, a physical river model, the size of this table, a bit smaller than that, a bit wider, uh, where we had a river, literally, water coming down with, with blue color. And it was shaping, in a way, the, the sand, similar to what a river would do in large scale. Uh, not necessarily meanders, but, but braided systems. Uh, so we were capturing digitally the physical stuff of the river and turning it into a digital model where we would imagine ecologies to be thriving and sort of like moving around and we casted some sort of like ecological modeling on top of the images of the river as if it would be a, some sort of like miniature accelerated ecology in the, in the space of the, the exhibition. So that was the space, that was the model and in a way we could capture what was happening here and make a virtual model of it that had an imagined ecology taking place. Uh, so those are the sort of like 3D outcomes that come from the digital capture. Those are people playing with the sand to then create the model. And this is a bit of an accelerated version of the video. So we can see how the sand is filling those pools that we have just created. And as the sand fills those pools, the sort of like 3D model updates. So you could actually see how your physical actions, almost, well, almost live, like this model would take two minutes to actually fill the pools. But you could actually see how your actions, in a way, are affecting uh, nature. So in a way, it was more of a playful, educational, or I would say, uh, art installation more than anything else. The last project I show 
is a skate park we are working on now. We hopefully we're starting building next week. Uh, it's in West Dublin, an area that was a slightly confrontational in that it, uh, there was a great deal of antisocial behavior in the area. Uh, there had been consultation processes where they didn't really want the skate park. The skate park being a noisy environment, uh, concrete, and some of the neighbors uh, here in the front didn't really want to see anything on the on the sort of like area of the skate park. So we had to, in a way, engage with that. There was a two-stage competition, so we went through the first stage, and between the first and the second, there was this consultation process. So what we wanted to do in this case is a consultation process that allowed the users, uh, which are both kids, daddies and mummies, as well as BMX and skate riders, to have a say in the design of the park. In this case, we focus more on the skate parks, on the, the skate BMX riders. So we did put together a physical model uh, of sand, like a sandbox, and we gave them some tools so that they could actually sculpt by hand their ideal skate park that was being captured, made 3D, so that in a way we could fit it in the design process and we could get feedback from it. What was, that's the sort of like a workflow, so we, we had people like designing spheres, joining them up, and we actually sort of like tried to had to, in a way, digest, post digest all the data because that was sort of like in a sandy box. What was interesting is that the kids really engaged in the design. We had 15 year old people that were super bored at the beginning of the consultation, but they all jumped into it and they all wanted to, in a way, play around. Uh, and they actually told us almost exactly what uh, we had to do. They, they told us we want the shapes here, we want this here, the shell. I'll go later through what all they told. But it was a useful exercise. Uh, here we go. This is a bit of a video of how, you know, where the material interaction, live capture, and digital editing was taking place. Uh, in that, you know, we had the kids playing. That well, that's my hand anyway. But uh, yeah, but those those were modeled by them. Like it was them literally telling us what they wanted, capturing it digitally, and then post editing it later on. So we could actually move around the bowls and then create a design out of it. Uh, what was interesting is that we had a lot of engagement from the youngsters, the parents as well that they wanted in a way, they told us many things about, you know, put the bowls to the west because that's higher, it moves away the noise from the neighbors, don't put, uh, well, we actually learned a lot about the skate design itself, about the spine, the plateau, the shell coming around, and I don't know if we are be able to build all those things, but it's a bit of a health and safety issue with all of the shells. But, uh, but I mean, mostly what we learned was quite down to earth information about skate parks themselves, but also how to put it west, away from the noise, to create some mounds and type and topography that would chill the noise. That is told us, that is a mummy told us how, where not to put the playground areas because, in a way, there was a lot of antisocial behavior, and in a way, I was planning, oh, let's put the playground beside whatever that is less windy. And they told us, no, 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 put it here, because it's more visible from the other side of the road. And that was completely counterintuitive for us. We would actually put it shelter, no? No, but they wanted it close to the road. So actually, it unlocked quite a lot of information. It unlocked knowledge that was quite useful. We didn't manage to put it into the presentation and to the competition, and in a way, the project is going through planning and it didn't really have any planning complaints because we more or less were ticking all of the boxes that they wanted to see, which was quite useful. Uh, so that's more or less the, the, the outcome of the skate park on the, on the west, the top of the image, and the playground area on the, on the south. And that's a view from the, the, the skate park area, the, sorry, from the top of the skateboards. So all in all, in a way, we've been working on, on this field of, of, of getting people to engage in design, uh, hoping that design itself is a way of tapping into information, knowledge, I wouldn't say information, but knowledge that didn't exist actually because nobody actually sat down to do it, which is one of, one of the basic plans of ideas of collaborative planning, of, of, of tapping into ways, ideas that didn't really exist until you actually sit down with those who want to do it. And the more sophisticated the tools we have, I think the more sophisticated the answers you get from 
people like Chai. So, yeah, thanks very much. So, hello everybody. I'm Hanade from Khatim al Alami, and I'm the manager of the sectorial planning and proposal. I will share with you a presentation about uh, what we call the evidence-based approach to spatial planning using uh, parametric integrated uh, spatial models. Now, uh, my presentation will be in three major parts. The first part is a small brief introduction about what is an evidence-based approach, why do we build, and why do we build urban parametric models, and how do we use them. Uh, to illustrate what I said, I will share with you three projects that I've selected uh, in three different regions with three different scales, of which two uh, of these projects I manage personally, and the third one is managed by my colleague, uh, Yusuf and Ahmed. Ahmed is here. Okay. So, uh, in spatial planning, the tendency usually is to, um, to go into spatial analytics uh, and uh, concepts that the client actually, uh, that the client are not usually convinced about. So uh, during our projects, uh, we actually have learned that uh, to be able to convince clients, we have to use uh, an evidence-based approach whereby we can visualize our, our, our analysis uh, using parameters uh, that can be measured so, and linked to various uh, socioeconomic data, land use data, land value data, movement patterns, transportation networks, environmental conditions, and others. This approach is dynamic. It's dynamic because the data is dynamic. And in the field of consultancy, to face our client, we think that this, this approach and these tools uh, actually is helping us to support decision makers to take decisions. And by this, we can bridge the gap between different and various and conflicting stakeholders that we usually face in, uh, in large uh, spatial slash regional uh, planning projects. So uh, why do we build a parametric integrated model? The previous project that we have learned on, we taught, uh, taught us that a conventional approach to spatial planning, uh, relying on spatial concept only and analytics are not always successful to provide solid background for decision making and leave the spatial problem uh, in an open-ended situation. I mean, no decisions are taken, no clearance on a deliverable is, uh, is being uh, given by the client. So we, are, we are in many instances, are stuck at, at stage or another. So why do we do this uh, and how do we do it? It's actually, uh, or how do we do it? It's by overlaying spatial, uh, several uh, spatial data sets on top of each other. And uh, the data is usually massive, uh, complex, uh, multi-sectorial, and spatial. So using this approach and the model to prove our, uh, our concepts is, is, is a tool we, we considered as a scientific uh, tool to justify our proposed solutions. So what is a parametric integrated model and what does it consist of? It, is, it uses GIS platform in order to conduct the spatial analysis and it consists of two major components. You have the data, multidisciplinary, multi-sectoral, uh, with different dates, and you have the parameters that you would introduce to build the model. Now, with the data, when we say data, it represents all the spatial and descriptive data that are compiled, corroborated, and cross-checked against each other in a, geo in, in a geodatabase containers. What we're usually faced with, and especially in, in, in regions that we work in, in the Middle Eastern region and cities, is that the data is not accurate, that the, uh, the data is outdated, sometimes they're not available, sometimes they're available but not accessible, it's the highly secure data, and it's always a challenge to populate our parametric design model with the data. Now, in many cases and in many projects, we have to do a lot of corrective actions to make this data usable and to be able to generate results, uh, let's say a valid, uh, scientifically valid results. 
So we have to do uh, derivative techniques, we have to do digitization, simplification sometimes, sometimes aggregation, disaggregation, gridding in some instances. So we always have to work on the data to, uh, to be able to work with it and, 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 and to, work to make the model workable. So, and then once we have the data set or the data container is ready, we move to the parameter, to parameters design. There are six major uh, steps that we are usually follow to build the model. The first one is decide what should be model and what level of detail should we include. Uh, stakeholders are usually engaged in this process because we need their an understanding of the inputs required and we always have to contextualize these parameters. Then we set the parameters and then this will form the base for the analysis. We do have to make sometimes the weighting of parameters because clients are in favor of, they have priorities that we have to consider in our uh, parameters against each other. Then we sit together a multidisciplinary team of planners, designers, and GIS experts where we, uh, we, put, we design the architecture of the model. We call it model architecture, by which we, we build the steps for what to take first, what the result, and how to overlay over the second result. We always get the preliminary result first, we do some testing, and then we revisit our model and we finalize the result. Now, this is the, let's say, the, the process of the work that we're doing in, in our projects. To, to, to illustrate further what I, what I just explained, I've selected three projects that I will talk about. The first one is in, I call it the Where is My School project, that's in the state of Qatar. It's, uh, it's a school master plan for the state of Qatar and we, we built a flow map, uh, a flow map model uh, using functional planning standards. The second project I will talk about is the, uh, uh, the I call it the equity social infrastructure planning for the city of Riyadh. Uh, we, uh, we build a location allocation model and the project is called the coordination plan for the social facilities in Riyadh. The third project, it's a relatively small project to, uh, compared to the other two projects. It's the land, uh, the main uh, theme of it is the land valuation process. We built a land valuation and wealth distribution model and the project name is Shalba Land Distribution in Nabati. I uh, will start with the first project. The project scope was a development of, a master, of schools master plan for the state of Qatar till the year 2030. Uh, the study area covered uh, the whole of Qatar. Uh, which is an uh, area of estimated area of 10,000 square meters. The developed area in Qatar is basically Doha and its metropolitan region, or an area around 2,500 kilometers square. The project scope entailed three main stages. The first stage was the assessment of the current conditions, current situations, identification of key issues and problems. Then. The second phase entailed the development of new planning standards. In Qatar, there was no uh, planning standards for uh, schools provision. Uh, the planning standards, and here just to elaborate a little bit about these standards, they are the catchment distance, the catchment population, and the area allocation per person. On this graph here, I'm not sure if everybody is familiar with this, but I will, I will explain them. Okay, in any, in any area where we work on, there's always, you have to provide the, um, we provide public services for the community we work on. So there are planning standards that we use in order to quantify the needed uh, uh, social services. And they are governed by three parameters. The catchment distance, which is the, the distance from each uh, social service. And by me and by social service, schools, mosques, church, hospitals, infirmaries, all the public services. There's the catchment population, which is the, uh, the area, uh, the, the, popul the population covered or served by, this, uh, ser by the service, and eventually the land needed for the service, which is the area allocation per person. Per person. Uh, this was the uh, second stage, and then the, the last stage is the estimation of uh, the, the current and the future needs for schools and the development of a comprehensive master plan until the year 2030. Now, here, what the main challenge in this project was, uh, we actually had two conflicting stakeholders. We had the client who hired us, which is the Ministry, the Ministry of uh, Education, and they were 
they brought us because they had some sort, some kind of uh, mis dis uh, let's say uh, unorganized school provision, and they had shortage in schools. And for them, according to their claims, that there were many schools were overcrowded. On the other hand, there was a counter client to us, which was the Ministry of Municipality and Urban Planning, the MMUP. And uh, this public authority, they, had, uh, they have completed the National Spatial Strategy for Qatar. And within the, strat the strategy, they had uh, completed also a study specific for the community facilities in Qatar. And for the school, it was a clear statement that they said there's an oversupply in the current public schools and all the lands requested by the Minister of Education were rejected by the MMUP. So basically they're saying to MOE, no more lands, no more to build school, no more to waste the money on, on school building. And here was the main challenge. Now, so w we, th we thought that this is really an intricate situ situation that it's very difficult, you know, to satisfy uh, the client and to, uh, I mean, it's, it was really in every workshop that we have to do in, uh, in, uh, with the client, we're always faced by claims that uh, that situation is okay, schools are oversupplied, and so on. So what do we have to do? We said, okay, let us review the study prepared by the MMUP to see where, where is the shortage, what is the main issue, and why there's this conflict. So the assessment of the study that was done by the MMUP showed that, in fact, the planning standards that they use are what we call the rule of thumb standards, it mean, meaning that they set standards for uh, the provision of schools uh, based on a benchmark study. On a benchmark study that compared the city of, let's say, Doha with other cities in the world, in the UK, in the USA, in Malaysia, in Africa, which we thought that these are not really um, uh, matching with this uh, current situation in, in, uh, in Qatar. In particular, the demographic conditions, the school typologies, I mean in Qatar you have segregation, schools are segregated between boys and, go and girls. The capacities of school also in, in, uh, in Qatar, they were really big and compared to the, to the scale of the city. And also there were typologies adopted by the Ministry of Education according to which the schools were provided. Another major issue that we, we think that, was, uh, that affected the study of the MMUP was the population morphological aspects. In Qatar also, the population forecast is very specific to the country because after the World Cup in 2020, 2020 there, was, there will be a decline in the population, meaning that expats will return to their countries. So again, this was a major factor that affected the result of the MMUP study. Now, then we said, okay, there is a deficiency in the study of MMUP, let us build a model a parametric integrated model using what we call a functional approach to planning standards. Okay, what is the functional approach? It's the approach that is based on scientific facts of students, of school's capacity, and of the actual uh, travel distance of cars, rather than w based uh, ba basing it on the uh, travel uh, walking distance, like they said, like they uh, like uh, MMP did. Now, and to measure this, we developed what we call the flow maps for the level of service assessment, the LOS. And by this, we were able to perform an accurate assessment of current school provision, which is based on factual parameters. And by this, we were, were able to provide an evidence-based results to indicate if schools are crowded or undersupplied. Now here I will have to, uh, uh, in the coming slide you will see a lot of uh, GIS uh, uh, model builder things, but just to give you an idea about how things work. So what is the main components, as I said earlier, we have the data, and to build the model, the data in, uh, consisted of the current enrollment of students, the age bracket, student nationality, previous enro enrollment rates, land use distribution, the traffic models, school locations, school capacities, all these were set in the model. We had to do many corrective actions uh, for, for identified gaps, like uh, collection of, of, uh, of missing data from relevant authority, mainly the population, um, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the smallest census blocks that we want. 
and we had to adopt many assumptions concerning the development strategies in Qatar, where the, where the population will go, where they will grow, what type of population, we're talking about migrant workers, families, and so on. So, um, once we set the data, we had to distribute the students across the state of Qatar. And to do this, the uh, subdivision plans for the state of Qatar that the client, the client provided to us were not really, um, uh, let's say, with a, in a good quality. We had to do some kind of gridding, where we gridded the whole of Qatar into hexagons. And this is the way we're doing it in GIS using the model builder. And for each hexagon, the way you see it, we have a number of students, their gender, their age groups, and their nationality. Okay, and so we have the students. The second layer is the, the distance, catchment distance. How much time is needed to get from, uh, from the KG to the, uh, to the uh, residential area? And so we didn't use the, uh, the conventional uh, what do you call the conventional um, uh, walking distance it's used, which is like uh, 4 kg is 250 meter, for primary it's 500 meter. We used actual travel, travel distance to the facilities. Like for kg, we used 10 meter drive, uh, 10 minutes drive for primary, uh, 15, meter, 15 minute drive and so on. And for this, we use a traffic model. Uh, where it included the impedance, the, the, traffic, uh, the traffic speed for each road, the impedance factors, and many other uh, data that I didn't include here. Now, we, these are overlays together, and a flow map was developed. The flow map here, it shows the, um, the uh, assessment of existing condition, the assessment of existing condition. The second slide. Uh, you see, this is the flow map that uh, we came up with. Now, the circles are the schools, and the color indicates if the school is oversupplied or, or uh, oversupplied with the normal conditions or under uh, or uh, uh, undersupplied. So, yeah. the yellow color is the population or the students in this case, the student distribution. Whenever the, the yellow color is darker up to orange or brown, it means that this is higher density of students existing. So, where are the needs? The needs are in, this is the negative of the previous one. You see, where you have the different shades of pink color, wherever it gets darker, it means you have a highest shortage. Whenever it gets lighter, it means you have a, a, a less shortage than before. So, according to this map here, we can say that within this area, schools are provided well, while here you have a shortage, there you have the severe shortage, and here. Now, we can say here that these two schools are uh, underutilized, meaning that these schools will have probably to be closed, and this one here, because you have two schools here, and you see the catchment of the school is relatively small, and you have another one here that is also underutilized. So we used these maps in our assessment with the client and the country client, and eventually we were we were be able to reach a consensus between the two uh, between the two parties that there is actually there is a shortage in, in, in the current supply of schools, but still the problem is in the distribution of the schools and the capacity provided for each school. So with this uh, simple, if you want to say map, okay, it was our tool to uh, to reach to, uh, to close the project and to be able to provide recommendations on how to enhance the situation uh, and to cut the expenses on building a new more schools where, uh, where these schools are not needed. So, uh, the second project that I will talk in is the, uh, the, uh, location, uh, the uh, social services planning for the city of Riyadh and we called it the equity and social infrastructure planning. Um, with this project, we built a location allocation model. Uh, the project is the study area covered 5,700 kilometers square. It's massive in terms of scale. It's almost half of Lebanon. It's the city of Riyadh. 
uh, we have uh, in this uh, city there is uh, 2,550,000 par parcels almost. There are around 11,600 public services points because this includes all the public services within the city. The scope uh, was to first update the base map, update the database, uh, estimate uh, the need for the current and the future to 2030. Also within the scope is to build a location allocation model because they want, the client wanted to automatically select the best location for the service, where to be allocated using a, a location allocation model. And uh, he also asks for a, an electronic portal where all this to be displayed in electronic portal to be shared by all engaged parties, mainly the services providers, which are the, minis the ministries in this case. The challenges in this project were mainly uh, the massiveness of the data. It was huge and massive uh, data that we have to collect for every single point of, of the services, talking about number of users, areas, number of floors, uh, conditions, ownership, I mean, so many fields. The scale also, I mean, the city is divided into 100, 193 neighborhoods each of around approximately four kilometers square. We have 15 municipalities within the city. We have also variety of services. We had 16 major type of services subdivided into 30 subtypes, which means for schools, you have eight categories. For mosques, you have two categories, local and Friday mosque. For, for health, you have infirmaries, hospital, Red Cross, uh, Red Crescent, and others. For the uh, population, and, uh, the population were li a bit uh, sensitive because it's in, uh, it's in KSA. We were, they gave us the population on the municipal level and uh, the forecast is a number. So they don't give you a lot of data where we can really manipulate and work with it. Um, the study engaged 17 stakeholders, 17, municipal, uh, 17 ministries, uh, 17 stakeholders, around uh, 11 uh, ministries, and prioritization conflict. Whenever we want to say that there is a shortage in mosques, let's say, there is a huge debate on schools are needed first. If we said that there is a need in, uh, in, in hospitals, the public open spaces, uh, Amana, you know, they will start to scream and shout, we need public open spaces more. So we had this always conflict and debate in every single workshop, what to allocate first and when. So we actually built on our experience in Qatar because this project came after Qatar. And uh, we did, we built the uh, LOS model, which is the level of service assessment model, and to identify where are the unserved and unserved areas by type uh, of service. The main parameters were population distribution, the planning standards, and the existing facilities. So the results of the first model was quantification of needed services, especially per location. So I included a map, yes. This is uh, the first deliverable, and this is a ne uh, this is a municipality. It's called municipality. Uh, what do we call it? It's Olaya municipality, and uh, you would see here that uh, the the dots are the uh, these are the um, infirmaries, and you would see where you have the pink colors are the where areas are unserved, and when it's blank, these areas are well served. And the size of the dot reflects the uh, size of the population served. This is for, 2020, uh, for 2016. Yeah. We did, from the, we did uh, submit it and the assessment was uh, convincing to the client. Then we moved to the second stage, which is the location allocation model. Uh, this is the model number two we built for the study. The parameters were served and unserved areas uh, per service, per neighborhood, which is the quantification of needed services. Another important uh, parameter was the land bank, and uh, the land bank included all the uh, available empty public uh, land identified by each ministry, and this was a huge 
uh, effort that we have to do because we have to collect all the available land from all ministries. And chasing ministries in uh, Riyadh is really difficult, was really difficult and took a lot of time. We, we integrated all these uh, inputs in the model and then we built the uh, model uh, to select which is the best location for each service based on a priority index. And this was done in agreement between all ministries saying that the priority number one will go to education. Let's say schools will have to provide it first. Priority number two will go to health, which means uh, uh, infirmaries, hospitals have to be provided second and so on. Uh, the, also, the, uh, the, uh, the best location was uh, based on the, where's the, the areas that are in uh, the sh most deficit. So this is took priority also a priority to allocate. And the third one is the availability of public land, where land for the public are available. Now this is a short movie, just uh, it's a cut from the, uh, from the overall movie we developed for the project. In, uh, it's in Arabic, but it gives you an idea how the model works. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure if it's too low or too high. Okay. Yes, I need to repeat it. Okay. by allocating uh, in, in other neighborhood the services uh, and this is I will skip here because I want to move I still have one part to talk about briefly okay so this is the end product just to give you an idea about where to allocate you see on the other side you see where did we allocate the best the, the best location for the service this is for the also for the health yep. there's a movie I will skip here and the, and the end up is that, or the, the conclusion of it, that when we managed to build this location allocation model and we build the land bank for the, for the client, we actually managed to save the client a huge amount of money if the uh, land swap is, is accomplished between different ministries. If the Ministry of Education would allow to give, let's say, some of the public lands owned by this ministry to other ministries, then we would end up saving around 28 billion, uh, 28 billion uh, Saudi riyal. The third project I will talk about is the uh, Shalba Al. It's about the shares distribution. Now the project is was small in, in size. Uh, it's around 900,000 square meter, but its importance lies in the value of it because we're doing land valuation for around seven, uh, 75 million dollars of land value. Um, the client came to us because the, they had a subdivision plan, approved subdivision plan, uh, consisted of around uh, 521 parcels, and they want us to distribute these uh, parcels on the inheritors. Uh, where, where each ha ha have its own, their own uh, shares. Here, this is the share distribution among the uh, among the uh, the owners. 20, 20, 23. So uh, this is the subdivision plan that was uh, given to us. Now, the question, the challenge was. How are we going to maintain, uh, uh, how are we going to provide them with equitable distribution of wealth of these lands among these uh, owners? The first step was that we got uh, the assistance of a, of, a, of a real estate expert and he provided us with, the, uh, with an approximate figure of these land values. 
In this map, the colors show the, uh, the, uh, the, cost, the plot prices per meter square. Where it shows that the, the blue is the highest, it goes up to the lowest in the blue. So how to do this, uh, this validation? How are we going to validate this land price? We started to do as the normal, con the normal procedure of analyzing size, the, the site by doing a, uh, a site analysis, the roads, topography, and then the opportunities of the site, uh, proximity to highway or not, uh, viewing the, public, the open space, the, the, the level of the, of the site, and the constraints, environmentally speaking, uh, the contour lines. Now, what we did is we actually here we built a model based on the main parameters that identified from the site analysis. The main parameters were suitability, accessibility, views, economic opportunities, and the environment. These main parameters were subdivided into sub-parameters where a scoring system was, uh, was designed uh, for each parameter. For example, accessibility was measured by main, main road, primary frontage, secondary frontage, corners, and so on. And if each plot achieved the sub-parameter, then it will score one. If not, it will score zero. I will skip this, uh, each sub-parameter, we generated a map just to see the sites, the, the plots, and the scoring of each plot. I'll also move fast here. I'm almost done. Yeah, one minute. OK. And eventually, we came up with this uh, land assessment map it, where we uh, gave values for the, for the plots. The, the orange are the higher value and the uh, yellow are the lower values and we cross-checked these with the original estimate that was provided by a real estate expert. Eventually we succeeded to reconcile between these two, uh, two land prices to come up with this, with this uh, final land prices of, uh, of each plot. And, and here uh, we had to do another model to distribute these land according to, uh, to uh, each owner uh, value or share of money. Uh, we also developed another model here to come up with different scenarios for land distribution. And alternative one, the difference was uh, in a way big between each share of each owner. We ended up both by the alternative two. And here we managed to give each owner its share of money with difference not uh, more than around twenty or twenty-eight thousand dollars, and this was adopted by the client, and the lands were distributed accordingly. Yeah. This is it. Good. Luck. So we have around uh, twenty minutes I think, uh, left. Uh, we'll uh, thank you first, uh, uh, Amy, Eduardo, and Hanadi for your super interesting presentations. Uh, I guess um, somehow what stands out um, across maybe all three uh, presentations is that even with the advent of, um, of all of these technologies, uh, uh, the use of uh, data sets, uh, data analysis, uh, and the different parameters at the urban, and but also at the architectural scale, uh, have not somehow removed the, the human-centered uh, interest, but rather somehow amplified it. Um, it might be uh, the fact that uh, information has become quite uh, democratized because of uh, you know the internet, uh, social networks, etc. Uh, but I guess um, I would like maybe to open the discussion on uh, uh, first how how has uh, you know this uh, human-centered uh, design, of course, affects uh, uh, what you do in your work, but also how how do you think you know the fact that the users are also now bringing in their own data sets into this process? How how does that affect also uh, the design process. Um, um, yeah, I, I guess, I mean, th that as a, as a starting, uh, I would say, uh, question. But also, uh, as a second maybe level, how, how do you see then the city itself potentially changing with, with those um, 
with the back and forth um, uh, feedback or the feedback between the users, uh, the information they're generating, and then these uh, data-driven design processes. Um, I mean, you, you could uh, answer, we could open up the floor for more uh, questions, so it depends on, uh, on you. Would you like to? One thing. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not going to respond to your question directly, but one thing relating to, to that, um, not so much about the the citizens or residents' um, data, generating data, but um, in general, I think that the design and the planning field, there is not much discussion about outcomes. There might be the public um, public consultation as a um, usual procedure to go through the development design and things like that, so there are stakeholder engagement, but still, the, you are looking at the design again, as I said in the presentation, that not understanding what it means to you. So, the bringing, uh, the, using the data to um, actually enable engagement, and that, that I think is really important. And probably that um, accountability of local authorities, developers, these things are kind of increasing, the scrutiny is increasing the citizens are probably more savvy to looking at the data, understanding. So um, it's probably a tool to open up the design discussion right. more widely. I completely agree on that. Like I think these tools, and let's not even get into the issue of artificial intelligence, at some point in time will really change, not necessarily the entire profession itself, but it will really oblige designers to be open about what they do. I think there's also a the, uh, level of honesty. Sometimes data can be used to conceal decisions that you didn't want to discuss. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think the minute you get more savvy sort of like users of data or, or people that understand how data and information works, you may end up having an opening up of, of a lot of the discussions and decisions that the design teams make. And I think that's good. It's harder for the designers because you actually have to discuss things you didn't want to discuss. But that's not necessarily bad overall. Uh, but, yeah. Well, I think that uh, the data is really something really valuable that we have to deal with it with oversensitivity. Because sometimes the data are presented in a way that will give uh, erroneous results and sometimes it's a misrepresentation of the actual conditions so from our experience we learned that whatever the first outcome of any analysis or data representation has to be consulted with the locals to be able to corroborate and validate the the output to uh, because they are the community are more they are more knowledgeable about the context from us the planners designers who are most of the time we are outsiders to the context so consultation about the results is really important for the process to be um, authentic, let me say, to, to, to reflect the existing conditions as they are. You've shown about uh, using all these physical simulation models by the users themselves, this participatory design process, somehow to maybe verify or actually not verify some of the initial assumptions that are taken. Um, is this something that uh, is applied at every single project or do you think that this, this is more relevant to certain scales of, um, of projects? I think, it is. I think it's, it's relevant. It's hard. It's easier in some projects than in others, but I think it's a, it's a beautiful project to think that the users can give you feedback other than the typical, yeah, we want a swimming pool or we want a football pitch and we want to hear. Like, like yeah, it is a certain, but it's a certain hypothesis that if you give people the tools to actually engage with design, they actually can climb up into higher levels of sophistication and discussions with the designers. Not necessarily the designers will want to engage in those discussions, but I think it's a promise that these tools have embedded in that you can really get people to discuss at other levels uh, about detailed aspects of of design. And in a way, as a designer, you have to be very clear about what is it that you are adding, how much you are willing to give away, 
And that needs that means that you have to take decisions beforehand as to, okay, I'm going to open up these things for discussion and this is the way I do it, which is not an easy thing to do. Like designers are not clearly trained to do that. Mostly are trained to, to deliver, but not necessarily to to deliver <laughs> openly. And that that's the bit that we were discussing about being open uh, at, at other levels. And I think that's a, that's a must for designers in the future, I think. Has any, any questions? Uh, if you can please provide microphones. Um, let's start with uh, Ro Robert or Lamajid. Uh, so my question is about how do you, uh, you have decision makers who are receiving those models and you're giving them proposals, but, uh, and I think uh, uh, Hanadi touched on this, like you have to convince them of the robustness and the validity of uh, of your model, and you said that you touch that, that you do that through uh, data uh, data evidence. Uh, but what other tools do you use to actually make sure that they uh, that they are convinced? And uh, in all three of uh, of your cases, and uh, uh, and is data actually enough? Uh, because often, it, like uh, that, uh, stories actually trump data, and emo and political interests trump data. Uh, I think. <laughs> when we work with clients, there are definitely many tools to try to convince them about the results, about the, the correctiveness and robustness of the result that we came up. One of them is this approach that we're adopting, the evidence-based data bit by bit. And what we do is we do multiple workshops usually to explain to the client and to our stakeholders what we did in every single step. And this is really tedious and time consuming. And sometimes we run over budget because this is not budgeted in many of the projects. So, and the, the level of education of the client member, they're not the same. Every, everyone has its own uh, uh, education level, political agenda, uh, background. So. We tend to simplify as much as possible to convey what we want to convey. So workshops, is this, this is the first important issue that we deal with our clients. Um, there's also, um, what do you call it, um, uh, authenticity on, in, in, the, in, the, in the answer that we give. And sometimes even if the result does not match the client uh, expectation, we have to say it. Not always, but we have sometimes to, to sacrifice a little bit of, of, uh, of, uh, of the deliverable to gain the credibility of the client. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, you, you touched upon the point of what is called adversarial science. Uh, and I think this one, the only way is, as it's been said is like making sure there's a number of sessions, workshops where the, the basis of the data is agreed upon before you get into the outcome because otherwise you're going to waste so much money. Like you can get into moments where you, different groups throw evidence at each other and there's just no upper limit of as to how much money you can spend on those things. <laughs> if make, like, completely the issue of the budget, I think that's, that's one of the things that has to be budgeted definitely for you. Risk can get into discussions. Um, to add to um, the um, previous comments, that I think there are two things. One is that um, the, um, especially the spatial network model, that um, it's, you can argue whether it's a data or model, but um, it, um, it's very intuitive. The people understand through their experience. So that's very important for us in reality, that first you show and then people understand that, ah, that's why that street, and I, I use that route all the time, and things like that. So that's still, it's kind of different level to the data um, validity, that people also have emotions, experience, and to um, resonate with the intuition, that's also quite important, to, to come, kind of use common sense, that, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so that's important. And they also, they, um, um, well, data is one thing, and I think, I think modeling is kind of the next level, the use of data. But um, it's important that um, modeling assumptions are really clear. And we 
I think one of the struggles or difficulties in the consultancy work that we do is that to first have a common understanding that model is a model. It's not the data, it's not the reality. There is a very, it's a very simplified version of the, the representation in a relatively mono kind of um, aspect. So that's something that I think um, sometimes we struggle, <laughs> but then we, we need to start with that agreement. Robert? Thank you. Uh, <coughs> I was trying to link your presentations to the theme of, of the conference, which is the issue of architectural urbanism, which brings the issue of scales of intervention. And I was thinking that uh, the most interesting uh, pro uh, proposition is actually the special syntax proposition for one reason, because it's based on spatial structure, and spatial structure is a shared uh, feature or is it shared analytical uh, uh, perspective that uh, that could be applied both on the on a building like you showed and on the city so uh, this could provide us with a link you know with a solid uh, maybe method of linking these two scales of intervention the architectural to the urban uh, my, my next question is about that um, if I compare the three presentations which are data-based, I can uh, uh, differentiate between two types of data. Uh, the first one is the stable data. I don't know how to call it. The stable data is linked actually to the physical patterns of the cities, uh, of to, to space. Okay, but the second is the dynamic data, which, you know, in the case of relational urbanism, what you are following is just diffusing your data and, and letting it interact with the users. And your, uh, this interaction is, is shaping constantly and reshaping your, uh, your approach to, uh, to your analysis. And I think that, uh, that uh, you know, this is a, uh, in the case of GIS, uh, um, the participative, this, uh, you know, it, although it is a, a maybe a fixed data, a stable data, it's of course subject to interaction with the client that could intervene in the process of formulating the project. But still, I thought I found really interesting while the space syntax provides a stable uh, approach that could bridge the different scales. What's really, you know, for me still interesting and, and you know, uh, uh, have a lot of potential, but a lot of uncertainties is this uh, dynamic exchange, you know, uh, that uh, that is integrated where with the f constant feedback from uh, from uh, through social media or or uh, you know whatever through through the internet. Uh, this is a comment. So I wonder, okay, how in the future this segregation between two approaches to database uh, uh, design or evidence-based design, for instance will be evolving in relation to the stability or the dynamic uh, process of, of uh, which is which is a form of, of you know the ultimate form of participation in a way comment on that because I think it's a very big topic um, so I think that the, you raised a very interesting point. Um, on the first, the scale point, um, it's actually, it's not the dichotomy of um, building scale and urban scale. It's actually seamless. It's multi-scale, yes. You probably meant that, yes. 
And I think that's uh, something that it, the, where the space syntax tool is very powerful, that you don't move between spaces, oh, okay, I'm now in the building, and all of a sudden you don't change the way that you behave. The, it, the environment but affect you in a certain way, but still you, you do navigation, you have the same brain. And so that the seamless scale, and even in urban scale, there is a local scale. Um, I didn't have time to, to show many aspects of this map scale analysis, but there is a local structure, and then you move towards kind of intermediate structure, and then you have the city-wide structure. The, the structures are very, um, hierarchy would be very different, but you experience in a seamless manner. And that's something that the, um, the, the spatial structure is kind of unique, how you influence on behavior. And the second point, I think that's very interesting and uh, where we at Space Inter can kind of really think about, um, because at the moment we don't really use a lot of real-time data. We are capable to use it, but mainly because we um, work on a planning project. So the planning in plan, planning project, the real time data, the value of the real time data is just amount of data, and you can begin to understand how the weather might have influenced on the um, on the movement patterns or volume and things like that. But not the fact that it's real time, um, because you're planning for the future. You kind of want to have the historic data and a deep understanding. You don't have to do it real time. <laughs> And, and also I think that it's, it leads to the question of this, that is it environment which impacts on behavior or is it actually people who impact on the environment? So it is both. So I think it's a very interesting question and we need to understand what is what is that it, the question? What's the purpose of doing the data analysis? Just because the, the interesting data is there, is it useful? How do we want to use it? Which one is the, move, um, what was the word, independent um, variables? Which one is the dependent vari variables? I mean, these things need to be understood um, clearly before you dig into the data and analysis. I, I think that the, the issue of the dynamism of of the data or all the tools that have allowed for dynamic drawing and modeling has in a way taught designers to think about the engagement with others in in different manners. And I think there is a architects are starting to get into the idea that planners have been playing for a while about designing as learning. So you design with others and you fabricate knowledge that actually nobody thought about. Uh, and that sort of like fabrication of knowledge itself opens up the question of who has the right to the generation of that knowledge. Is it you are the custodian or no, not really. Or you are a good curator that actually is way better than the others and you better organize these things to ask the right questions. I think, and, the, and I think it, it points to a question that has been running in planning for so long, which is the idea of expertise. You are an expert on, on what? So you better have a very clear idea of uh, what are you an expert of and how do you, because you have to have experts, like it is not that everybody knows everything and just because you have participatory design and dynamic data, everybody can design, uh, but, but I think architects will have to start thinking much more strongly what is it that they are adding into the mix so that the expertise they've learned in a way makes sense in different situations, in different ways and that's where the dynamism, I think, enters and should teach us how to think ourselves of what we are experts on, really, uh, more than just thinking, oh, the architect comes to the room. Which, yeah, of course, if we have to come to the room and we have to have a job, but, but how do we think about those things? Uh, I have just uh, one uh, last question, unfortunately, and, and I'm sorry, I'm and I have two questions in my one last question. Thank you so much for these presentations. I have one for Amy and one for Eduardo. They're pretty simple ones, though. Uh, Amy, so I was really struck by the photo of Trafalgar, Trafalgar Square that you showed as if that was the data that would check the model. And I wonder if you ever, in your work, actually gather data afterwards to see whether your models are predictive 
I mean, literally more than just seems so obvious. But um, and Eduardo, in your case, uh, I wondered whether or not the kind of project you had undertaken, a skate park, didn't lend itself particularly well for what you were trying to show. In other words, that skaters know so much about skating, much more than the designer does, and that it's a single landform. And I wonder how you would see your uh, interactive tools operating in a more complex architectural yeah. setting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite clear. It's one of the first things that we, that, oh sorry, but you want to <laughs> of, of the issue that the designers, in that sense, the people knew what they wanted so specifically. And that wouldn't necessarily be the case where if you're asking them about a park, a public space or whatever, like, but that doesn't point to the fact that they won't have an opinion. Uh, so I think it points to the fact that we have to learn to understand how the ideas that the people have in the back of their minds map against the ideas we have of design ourselves. So th th they will have ideas, they will think about, not about modernism, they will think about other stuff, and we need to know what is it that they think. But I think it's not that we have to, but I think there's a benefit in understanding how people design about what we do uh, first. Uh, so that we can really start asking the questions uh, and let them learn to get to a level where we can have those discussions. Because obviously the skate park, the skate guys knew what they wanted. And in other cases, you will have to find tools to get people up to speed to a certain moment, to a certain level with the problems that you are wanting to ask about. But it's a very pertinent question, clearly. Um, yes, thank you for the question. It's actually, <laughs> I feel very fortunate that in this case, yes, we have done the post project uh, <laughs> surveys. And I don't know if you remember this, uh, four maps observed. And uh, so the last one was actually a post project observation that actually quantified the movement and the maps, what is movement, the stationary activities, and so on. Um, unfortunately, in the usual consultancy services, um, service that we provide, we don't always have an opportunity to, to do that. It's, it's really a shame. We, we, are, all, we are planning to, to do more of that. But at the same time, this is where we really value the relationship with the academia. So space syntax is a kind of established discipline at the UCL as well as um, kind of taught and researched in many different universities. So the people always kind of use the methodology, correlated with the movement, and then correlated with other social and economic parameters. So in the way that in the wider world that this kind of effectiveness and the relevance is being kind of proven in academia, so we always refer to that. And so that's a very good collaboration between academia and the practice. Um, well, once again, uh, I would uh, really like to thank you, uh, Amy and Eduardo and uh, Hanadi, for your very insightful uh, presentations. And uh, thank you for our audience for sticking around and for your questions. Uh, we have a ha have an half an hour break, Robert, uh, before the next uh, keynote lecture, true? Okay, so we'll start again at two, I guess. Yeah.